taking notes for us, Sandy Anderson, my, uh, our administrative assistant uh, for all the selectmen. Um, and we, this, is the, um, this is a public um, information, inf well, uh, we'll call it a public hearing. Um, I think we worded it differently on the, um, on the agenda. This is a chance for the public to weigh in um, to the Board of Selectmen, there'll be uh, maybe other chances to do that when, it, when this, um, this plan hits the Planning Commission. But this is an opportunity for the public to weigh in um, on the POCD. Um, I know, Michelle, you're, I see you here. Um, I, I don't want to call you the author, but the, well, you were the lead. You were the chair of the subcommittee. Is that true? So you have some folks here that might be on that committee. Is that true? You want to Correct. introduce yes. them? Yes, I see um, Kirk, Rosemary, and Rich, who all are also members of the Plan of Conservation and Development uh, Steering Committee. Sure. Um, Kirk and Rich are also on the Planning Commission uh, with myself, where we will have a public hearing in November on the same document, just to confirm what you were just saying earlier. Thank you, thank you. That's that's good to know for the record for us to to be able to come come again. Those those in the public and, and even the selectmen can go there. I, this is uh, about 135 pages. Is that what I'm saying? I read them twice. Um, 270 pages, I think. Um, so I read it twice. Uh, my hats off to you, Michelle and uh, Rosemary and Richard and Kirk and the rest that aren't here tonight. You did an outstanding job. So much information in, is packed in here. And, and of, of course, to our staff as well that helped you out. So uh, wonderful. We'll, we'll um, in the tradition of a public hearing, we'd like to hear from the public. So I will open up the opportunity for anyone who would like to speak. I'd like you to um, state your name, your address for the record, and try to limit your comments to certainly within five minutes, um, if, if, if it's appropriate. And if you can, um, you know, we, we, while we don't have a lot of participants here this evening from the public, we'd still like to, uh, you know, contain the comments. So would anyone like to speak? And how you do that is you unmute yourself and you scream real loud or you introduce yourself, I guess. Um, would anyone like to speak? There's also a chat feature. Um, there's also, um, you can raise your hand and I think you hit the button in your little square and you can raise your hand. If you're calling in, I don't think anyone but Mrs. Hardy's calling in. Um, there's ways to unmute yourself that way. But is anyone having difficulty? Would anyone like to speak? Okay, I'm going to also uh, allow the public to speak at the end of this if they would like. Um, and I'm going to give the chance for the selectmen to kind of go through their, uh, what they've discovered and, and maybe put some stuff out there for consideration. Um, would anyone like to go first? Mark, I have about 11 comments. Do you want me to go through them or just go through a few at a time and then pass it? Pass it I, I, why don't you go ahead and do it? And then, um, yeah. Um, and of course you're not limited to five minutes, but uh, um, okay. let's, let's, let's get <laughs> you a step said that. <laughs> I just, Yeah, you wish you, you're gonna wish you didn't say that. Um, so some of these are comments. Um, some of my, my, my personal opinion, just throwing some uh, ideas out there. Uh, for you guys to consider, and if uh, anyone else agrees, let me know. Um, so I'll start on page 17. Um, something I've been following a little bit is um, the um, some of these new technologically advanced hydroponic greenhouses, and um, you have some case studies that you had in there in certain areas. I don't know if it was page 17, but Devons, Massachusetts did something interesting to allow um, kind of an industrial uh, agricultural use where they're using very um, sustainable practices for um, hydroponic, uh, I think it's lettuce in that area. And uh, it's become a pretty big business there. It's something interesting that we may want to consider. We have all our farms in town, um, but it may be worth looking at maybe allowing a possible, you know, to look at possible floating zones of more um, agricultural, um, with a little bit of an industrial use of, of using greenhouse uh, greenhouses to be um, 
more sustainable um, for the few, you know, more technological advanced hydroponics. So that was just one comment for feedback, Michelle, um, for your consideration. Um, page 34, I'm just gonna go through the pages. Sure. Um, some of them will be questions. Um, Mark, we're allowed to ask questions. Sure, oh, sure. Okay. Absolutely. We kind of we're gonna hybrid this meeting tonight, where it's we have we have folks here that that authored this. So I'd be happy to admit them in. Okay. Oh, well, one of my other comments is I would love to see your names on here. You guys did a lot of work, and I'd like love for you guys to take credit for it. So somewhere in there, it'd be great to have your committee names in there. Um, we actually just learned we have to do that, so we will add, we will okay, add that. Okay. Excellent. Good. <laughs> Um, page 34, um, it says, number one, consider adopting zoning regulations requiring that all lots containing a minimal area of buildable um, land to further protect sensitive environments areas. So we have this, I believe, in zoning for residential. Are you, um, I'm not sure if it's in there for, for commercial and industrial. Do you know what, the, can you explain what the intent of that was or do you know what the intent of that was from the comments you got from other, other parties? I do, and if I can just give me a, Give me a minute to pull up page 34 um, because we did look quite a bit at the um, CDD regulations when we were developing this and you know who was a great resource for us um, with that in particular was Norm Peck, um, also a member of the subcommittee. Right. Um, you're on page 34? 34, yeah. It, what, what paragraph we're what we're on 34 uh the first paragraph number one consider considering so i think we have that for for residential um so i don't know if it was to expand yeah. on that or mm -hmm. yeah so this was outside of residential areas as well so um okay. a lot of the uh conversation on this came um when we were talking about uh the commercial districts and things, you know, abutting potentially environmentally sensitive areas and uh, looking at minimum buildable lot requirements for those as well. Okay, that's what I was, I, was, I just wanted to make sure we weren't repeating what we already have. So that, nope. okay, um, page 49. Um, you know, this comes up a lot. This is, this is a pretty good outline of open space, but maybe a bullet um, in consider the town being more proactive and um, finding open space acquisition opportunities instead of sometimes it's handed to us after it's already been through developers and stuff like that. Sometimes mm -hmm. maybe we should be a little bit more proactive. I think that would be a good goal mm -hmm. uh, to document. Um, page 52. Um, so page 52 talks about um, numbers of population mix for the schools. And you and it's referenced in here, uh, POCD from Southern, you know, Southeastern Connecticut Council of Governments. Did you guys also, uh, by chance, look at the Board of Ed study that was done a few years ago when we were doing the schools? So we did. Um, okay. This data was more recent. In fact, the chart that you're seeing that has all the orange on it at the bottom of um, page 52 was provided to us just this year. Well, I guess they did it in 2019 by CCOG. Um, and we may have for the, um, when we, this, as you know, you're looking at the draft, um, they were also adding in, they did the study before EB started doing all the hiring. Mm -hmm. um, so they were adding in how electric boat may impact um, these numbers, but, all indications were that that this was the most accurate population. We had a bunch, and this was the one we went with. Uh, they were all very similar. Okay, I asked because when when the board of ed did it, one of the initial studies didn't impact uh, have the impact of EB in it, and then the second one did. So um, I was familiar with that. Uh, page fifty nine, um, number eight. It says allow the construction of accessory apartments on single family lots to diversify housing offering without contribution to sprawl and reducing space available for commercial use. Mm -hmm. um, what are you, are, what are we, what are we looking for there in those comments? Are we looking for in-laws apartment or are you looking for just accessory rentals to anyone? Um, could be either. We, there are some that exist in town right now, but they're non-conforming. 
So um, we would like to make them an allowable use. And the, the further discussion is that you could make them allowable as deed restricted uh, for income based requirements. Okay. I know, um, you know, um, we don't necessarily allow in-law apartments with separate living uses. And I know that allowing rentals in single family, single, single family residential neighborhoods is, is kind of a controversial subject. So I was just wondering if you had a lot of debate about that, because that is fairly we, controversial. Yeah, we looked at some case studies that actually showed it as a really good opportunity to add affordable housing um, in towns that already have a lot of single family dwellings the way that we do. Um, so uh, we can certainly pull up the supporting documents that we looked at about that, but there was pretty good consensus um, among the team on the whole document really, but uh, this to this comment as well. Okay, um, you know, just following up on that with affordable housing, there's um, multiple definitions of that, as you probably know, and the mm -hmm. state has a different definition than what um, we would consider affordable housing in town. It has to do with deeded um, restrictions. Um, so just throwing out there for, for, for comment. Um, number 70, page 72. Um, uh, okay, number uh, 2A, um, something that struck me is consider allowing residential development in Northern Flanders by special permit. Um, I've never seen that before. Most people that have um, land up there have, you know, you know, by right to, the, to put a house on there, um, a single family house. Can you elaborate what, what, um, where that came from and, and what the, you know, the full intent of that is? Yeah, and I believe this one came from the Love Study in 2010, but it, it looks at, there's kind of two ways to, that we address, um, preservation of agricultural land by way of development. So uh, this recommendation suggests that we could rezone the north end of town as an agricultural zone rather than a residential zone, uh, in which case uh, you would do housing by permit. Um, the other way, also in A, would be or to um, expand allowable uses of agricultural properties to uh, address things like B&Bs, farm to table, um, weddings. What we are hearing and seeing is that there need to be additional revenue streams sometimes to support these large acreage pieces of property beyond farming. So to, you know, to expand on the, to either zone them only as agricultural or expand on the allowable uses would be two different ways to go about that. Are you, are you guys thinking like rezoning existing areas that are residential as agricultural or just certain plots of land? Because I'm sure that would be controversial for yeah. the resident, yeah, you know, sure. neighborhoods and people that own house, you know. Yeah, I'm certain. Listen, there's a lot of stuff in this document that I'm sure will be controversial, just as there was in 2009. But the the beauty of the plan of conservation and development is that it's a set of policy recommendations to consider. It is not a new set of policies, right? So no, no, yep. we're outlining potential solutions for the town to look at over the next 10 years. This is a potential, it, it's an option on the table. Whether okay. we decide, the town decides they want to do that or not, that's, you know, would go through procedural process. Yeah, and I, I, do, I am aware of that. That one just caught my attention as, mm, I'm not so mm -hmm. sure about that one. Yep. Um, They're down that road already. So Mark, to follow up, I think what you're going to say is the, um, I was just about to say that because Mark and I have been through cases where some farms wanted to get the weddings. Is that what you were going to say, Mark? Yeah, we've been there. We've been there and we've had substantial public debate on that. Mm -hmm. And um, it went back and forth. And a lot of the concern we heard from residents was the 
commercialization of it to the point where we get um, events that could lead to alcohol on some of this alcohol. And noise. Uh, yep, and, and use. Yeah. And very residential uses on small roads. Mm -hmm. uh, potential people leaving weddings, you know, after having too much drink. That was a lot of what we got feedback on, if I remember, that people had concerns of that. So I know it's an out. This has been discussed, and we've had applications in the past that have been some have been denied, some have been allowed. Yep. Um, but that's just some background on it. Yeah, and we're totally aware of that. Um, but it, it, this is a a menu of potential solutions. So think about it. Maybe like that would kind of explains our mindset. Understand. Um, let me go, I think 77, I had a comment. Um, oh, so this, this section is talking about uh, Parks and Rec and stuff. And I just, just from some uh, personal experience having kids involved in the system and the rec programs and in the school programs, I wouldn't mind seeing a bullet there to encourage better, better sharing of town fields between park and rec and uh, school fields. Um, we have a lot of fields um, that are underutilized um, both places and before maybe we consider building new fields, we may want to consider maybe doing better sharing of assets between two town entities. I totally agree with you and that is addressed in on page 82. Um, it was tough here to decide what to repeat and what to just uh, sure. put in one section or the other, but bullet three on page 82 suggests just that, that an inventory be done between the schools and Parks and Rec together to address, um, you know, inventory and maintenance and, and needs for actual facilities. So well, maybe just I, right if you feel I, like I see exactly what you're looking at. Maybe if we just add in that bullet three, um, it just says Parks and Rec Department. Maybe also add the school school fields. Yeah, that's maybe in the clarify. school section. So I'll, I'll we'll make that more clear. Okay. Okay. Because somehow I missed that. Okay. Good. Well, yeah, I, I agree. Um, number um, eighty-three. Something to consider, and maybe this is, we we have. We have, to rest we have to store a lot of town documents at the town hall, especially in town use. And um, I'm sure state policy will dictate what we can do, but it would be good maybe to consider digitizing a lot of our records to save actually space. It just seems to me in this day and age wasteful to be reserving part of our building department um, uh, footprint in the town hall for just documents when maybe we can move to digit digitizing them they've done a lot of that what's that mark they've done a lot of that yeah and, and in fact the, the, the committee made mention of that somewhere in this document um there's some things that have to be right you know originals and the hard copies but they've gone we, we're beginning that process of digitizing everything and, and going that way okay yeah so that was the um number 90 um page 90 I think there's um, I think uh, there's been a lot of studies in a lot of communities in the country that have actually considered um, uh, for certain large scale developments, commercial developments requiring certain certain um, allocation of electric charging stations. And I think as we move forward, you know, I I believe we're going to be going more to an electric car market, um, where more and more are going to be electric charging. Um, so for example, when you have a big, I think it's almost in the business's interest, but it may be considered to try to get the businesses that are gonna have big businesses that people that may spend a lot of time there, consider them having electric charging stations. So that would be, um, Mark, I, I'm picking up on your idea and I don't want to interrupt because I have my own ideas, but maybe, um, so on the next development, let's say Costco phase two, right? The retail section, that it's a zoning requirement. So maybe yes. the zoning regs have to have that within their requirements saying, if you're doing this, there you go. Or even stop and shop. If you're renovating a building, yep. um, you, 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 you're required uh, to, 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 to put in electric charges. That's a good idea. That's exactly what I was thinking. Yep. Yeah, that's a good yep. Idea. And those are the businesses I was thinking. And in a lot of ways, it's probably in their best interest. Um, but it may be something that zoning could look forward to in the future. 
as we move forward to an electric vehicle economy. Um, number, I'm almost done, I promise. You're doing good. Okay, thanks. Uh, page 118. Um, we got um, number 20, four prioritized areas for sidewalks. I think those are all really good. I got a call today about uh, somebody um, about, and I, I agree, extending the sidewalk should also be a priority. I think the Patagansett Lake that is well-traveled, uh, especially among students with uh, different sports down to the crew field. And they're walking kind of on the road into and beaten paths. But that I think would be a priority. It's not that much more to go to get to Patagansett Lake. I think that would be, I think that would be useful. Uh, there's only gotta be a couple lots left, right? No, it's, it's not much. It's not much. But that's just something, thank you for letting me know. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll put that on our, that's just something we'll I mean, do that it works. We'll yeah, no, I agree. CRE. Documenting here would be good, but we should consider that. I don't okay. think that would yeah. take that much. Yep. Um, the last thing um, I have on my notes was um, we have a subcommittee, and I don't want to speak for Dan or Paul, but we have a subcommittee on uh, uses down at Cheney Park for our docks. And there's been discussion, it's, um, when we do our leases and we're about to do it and we're about to meet again, there is a lot of interest um, down there for um, commercial dockage opportunities for commercial fishing and aquaculture. Um, we have three, possibly four docks there. Um, there is potential room uh, in Cheney Park to expand that and to kind of make our own little fishing fleet like they have down in Stonington. And, um, I think there's some opportunities we could explore there. And that's something I'm interested in. And I think, I'm not sure where that belongs. I don't know if that belongs on the coastal resources. And I'm not speaking for everyone else. If everyone else kind of agrees, I think that would be um, a bullet that we may want to add. That's something we may want to investigate. But I can tell you, we turn a lot of people away. And I'm not necessarily talking about um, sports fishing. I'm talking about like actually working um, Fishing. Commercial fishing, yeah. yeah. Full timers. Full time, yes. So I'll leave it at that. I know other people got a lot of comments, but those are the, the major highlights that I had. I just had some, you. some clarifications and some suggestions. Good start, very, very much more organized in my comments. Uh, good job. Um, anyone else like to go next? If I, uh, I assure you I won't be that long, but uh, sorry, Mark, I had to. <laughs> He, we were talking before the meeting. He said he had 40 comments and it was going to take whatever. Uh, first thing on page 113, uh, 5A, we're talking narrowing, narrow driving lanes to encourage automobiles to drive slowly. I like that one very much because, I mean, we, we all know that they have to be so many feet wide uh, if, you know, the state is kind of specific in how you do that. But we have roads like Cory Lane and so forth like that now that don't even have a line down the middle. And if you had a line down the middle with, you know, of course, it'd be a little bit more work for public works, but the, you know, identify the shoulder areas and so forth like that, it does kind of close it in like that. And I think it's worth, you know, keeping that in there and talking about it. And formalizing the parallel parking is such a great idea because you look down on Main Street right now during the summer, you see people parking uh, in different areas. And just reading this, uh, I was just thinking of looking through this yesterday might want to also designate, I think we have to go through the state with this because that is a state road too, is uh, loading zones. Because we'll see sometimes that a truck has to offload something and there's really nothing designated from say eight to four, a loading zone. So maybe just do something a little sure. bit in there too. And then uh, the only other thing, to, uh, and I like talking about the sidewalks too. Um, Michelle, I'm sure you've talked to, uh, with Joe Bergaw because he does have a plan for sidewalks and that. So that's a, a great opportunity. And I do think, you know, moving up Gorton Pond and stuff like that um, would be a great idea, especially when you're talking about bikes. There's some roads such as, you know, parts of Dean Road. There's just no way you could ever get a sidewalk in there or a bike lane in because the road's fairly wide enough for two cars, but there are areas where we could. And then moving to page 124, talking about uh, the recommendations uh, when we're getting into public safety here and emergency. I really like uh, number one about improving the IT infrastructure, which we're in the process of doing right now. And it talks about a lot of things too. And I especially like under 3A, uh, 
addressing the fact that we're way understaffed in the police service right now at having 1.6 officers uh, per 1,000 by 2.2, which is recommended. So just, you know, those are positive comments. That I like the fact that they're addressed in there. And those are the only comments I had. I think it's overall a really good document to bring forth some ideas for discussion over the next several years. That's it. Thank you. Anyone else like to go next? Sure, I'm happy to. Sure. Um, and again, yeah, I mean, an impressive document. There's a lot in here, um, a lot to refer back to, an, an excellent uh, job. Uh, some of the observations I had, um, I guess we'll go by page. On uh, page 23, recommendations, uh, town wide education for best practices for landscaping and lawn management to improve water quality. I think uh, that is very important. It's vital uh, in protecting uh, the Nyanic River, particularly in those areas that are close to it with the watershed and the you know, fertilizer runoff into the river. Um, I think the more we can do in educating the public as to better ways to take care of their lawn, so they're not aggravating the, uh, the situation on the river. I think that's very important and I hope uh, that that education aspect can be emphasized in the future. I think that'll be very helpful. Um, on uh, page 34, there was a recommendation uh, with respect to uh, specifying road reduction widths from 30 to 24 feet um, uh, and to reflect 24 foot wide roads in future subdivisions. Um, I, 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 I hope that they, uh, they would get input from public safety and just to be sure that if, if we start reducing road widths that, uh, you know, fire truck apparatus and uh, uh, other uh, vehicles of that nature won't have trouble negotiating any of the turns or uh, uh, access areas in some of these uh, subdivisions. So um, while I understand the logic and, and with respect to the runoff on the road, I do think we have to consider um, and get input from public safety uh, in, uh, in that area. I can, if, if you don't mind, Dan, I can clarify yeah. that one just a little sure. bit. So the, um, the 18, the 24 feet uh, recommended is the regulation for the conservation design districts, which are really the only uh, subdivisions of, of notable size that can be built now for um, four lots, 10 acres or more. So, uh, but the, it is in conflict with the subdivision regulations. So this is a recommendation to actually get both of the recommendations, both of the regulations rather on the same page. So, so the 24 feet is an approved width currently. It's just that it doesn't appear in the subdivision regulations except in a conservation design district. So this is to make it more uniform. Exactly. Yeah and avoid conflict between the different regulations. Yep. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. It was a good, good spot. Um, this is a, on page 95. This is an area that I've spoken about before and that I'm just very concerned about and I'm glad to see it in, in, the, uh, in the printout here. The uh, emerging contaminants, uh, PFAS and uh, PFOAS, uh, those those are used in uh, firefighting. Uh, it's a, it's a foam that they use to fight oil fires in airports. Um, I, I think we have I think we have to be very careful uh, and and try to do what we can do to regulate that and understand where that might be used and and uh, and be alerted if there's any potential for the use in East Lyme. I uh, there is there is there is. There is. is yeah, I've gone to a couple, I don't interrupt you, but while you're on, the PFAS no, wanna... is a man-made um, um, uh, chemical that doesn't ever go away. It doesn't wash out, it doesn't break down. It's, it's a, you, you correctly call it what a long-term um, man-made chemicals manufactured, um, Teflon especially, right? Um, this is where it came from. But because we have the National Guard bases, they frequently um, and abundantly used um, products that would contain PFAS in their, in their operations. 
Um, I don't have that confirmed, but that's a national trend. And if you have a national, if you have a, a base in your town, we have two, um, that is a very, very strong, there's a very, very strong um, uh, chance that you have PFAS in your, in your, in your land. Um, we are concerned about that. We're waiting for the state of Connecticut uh, to, to make some findings. Um, the, 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 the findings in New York, they, they reduce their, um, what's allowable, PFAS, which is the, that it's allowable in the drinking water to a ridiculously small amount. Most of, most of Long Island is being um, dug up um, and, and, and it's a very expensive process. Dan, you're absolutely right. Um, I, if PFAS, I don't know that you could even build a facility now that puts out PFAS. This is stuff that's been dereg uh, been regulated now. Uh, but it's the foam for um, for firefighting that, of course, we had um, air traffic at the uh, at the National Guard over. Um, uh, in the north side of town and um, in, in the south side of town too. So we are looking at that. I've been to many, many seminars on that. And it's a very, very big concern with our water and sewer department. So thanks for highlighting that. Yeah, any way I can emphasize that. I'm yeah, sorry. Thank you, Mark, for the insight. Apologies. And in somewhat the, uh, the same vein, uh, on page 97, um, you know, salt management and, and treating parking lots and roads. Again, that's another area where we really uh, need to pay attention to it. I'm, I was happy to see that recommendation uh, in the report. Um, you know, we've got to stay on top of that and try as much as possible to develop procedures uh, to minimize the use of salt as, uh, uh, as it works its way into the water. And then finally, uh, for me, uh, uh, page 101, single stream uh, recycling. I, I still think there's confusion um, for a lot of folks in town as to what goes in the gray bin and what doesn't and what, um, I, I think that if we could just do a little more in educating the public uh, as to what materials they can put in there and which materials they should not. So it doesn't uh, screw up the shredders and the you know, plastic bags tend to bind up the, uh, the shredding uh, equipment. So if we could educate the people in town, uh, the more the better, because uh, I think we're very fortunate to have Scara area and, and do the good work that they do. So uh, those are my observations for what they're worth. Worth a lot. Thank you, Mr. Cunningham. Um, who's next? Mrs. Hardy, you're out there, right? You've got it. I am out there. Are you saving your wisdom to the very end? Right. I'm going to let everybody else do the work, and then I'm just going to chime in. All right. Well, I'll go next if Roseanne doesn't want to. Okay. <laughs> on okay, page, go ahead. On page 51, just a curiosity question on the uh, Census Bureau population growth numbers. Um, what's the reality of really having a declining population uh, based on the, you know, the recent number of housing units that the town has added over the last couple of years since 2000. I think that study was done in 2017. Does that, yeah. where do you as a committee think that projection stands? Not that you're any more of an expert than other folks in town, but just, uh, just curious on what you, how accurate you thought that may be. Well, yeah, there's a few notes on that. One, all of the studies kind of pointed the same way. Um, uh, as far as decreasing population and an aging population. However, I completely understand where you're coming from uh, with the housing and um, personally have that question myself. The good news is that we've just completed another census. So um, we will get better data very soon. And I believe that happened in the uh, last update of the POCD as well, where it was written in 2009, but then updated in uh, 2010, right after they got the census information. So I wouldn't be shocked if um, we wanted to go back and, and reevaluate some of that with, with new numbers. All right, thank you. I, Paul, let, let me chime in, and, and, and Michelle, to, to, to make your comments and push them forward. Yeah, it's, it's unrealistic to think that we've shrunk population-wise, don't forget the prison population is part of our population. 
And uh, when Gates was fully operational and the women's prison, York was pumping uh, with, with full, full beds, uh, 1,500, 1,600 prisoners. I might be off. It might be more. I'm, being, I'm giving you a conservative number. Pre-COVID, they were at 550. We learned last week, I know there were six something. And we learned last week they're at 350. So when you go from 1,600 or more down to 300, and I know, the dates are off on the all these censuses being taken, but that is what was determined as the the drop in population in East Lyme. Uh, it benefited us in a whole lot of ways because we pay a lot of fees based on our population. So our fees for certain programs and, and uh, uh, committees went down. However, um, it hurt us a little bit too uh, with that with those numbers. But that's the explanation that I've been given. Because you're right, we're adding home stock and we're losing people. But but the other thing is, yeah, you're talking about seniors, one or two people in a in household versus a family of seven or six or five. Thank you. Okay, um, on page 56, the highlighted area about where to put the those two organizations or two businesses, I, I'm sure you're still working to resolve that. Yes, <laughs> there are two developments that belong in the chart in one section or another. Uh, you'll find a lot of yellow highlighted areas with table numbers missing, things like that too. This is the, the, the treat you get for being the first group <laughs> to view the document. So little okay. Easter eggs all over this thing for you. <laughs> okay, on page 64, I, I believe I, my notes are correct. Um, the solar arrays that, you, that you're referencing is for uh, parking lots, I believe, correct? Yes. Um, on a personal level, professional level, uh, I've looked into that before, but it is comes with a lot of resistance from adjoining property owners to have solar array panels um, in a commercial parking lot that they have property adjacent to and all they can see is solar panel. So from a zoning standpoint and interaction with neighbors, that, that recommendation could uh, yield some opposition. I know it's only a recommendation, but um, solar energy is fantastic green energy source, but to put it over large parking lots, um, you know, maybe in the industrial parks or something like that, but to go into a large commercial like Flanders parts or even Costco um, with neighbors, it, it, that, that could be troublesome. So just my opinion, not asking you to change it. Um, on page 88, uh, recommendation number three on the microgrids. Um, my experience there and the way it's worded is to have the town solely be dependent on microgrids or renewable energy sources um, is uh, microgrids don't work very well, a single one, to go cover, you know, all the town buildings that are so spread out around town. Um, it's, uh, the cost becomes prohibitive when you have to, you know, put transmission lines from one facility to another over a great distance uh, to support the microgrid. So that's just something to consider. A microgrid works good for a good cluster of buildings. Uh, but when you spread them out, you end up really having to go to multiple microgrids uh, to do that. So it doesn't take away from the recommendation, but um, I think it, I think microgrids as a solution for 100% of the town's energy usage is, is probably a little impracticable. Yeah, we can look at how to word that to make it more clearly because uh, my understanding of the document and Rosemary um, is our expert in this online as well, um, is that we're suggesting exactly what you suggested, but if it's not reading like that, um, we can look at the wording. It, it wasn't uh, pull East Lime off the grid. Okay, and um, likewise, recommendation four on the renewable energy. Uh, I'm sorry. Take me forever to get back to that page to correctly. But, um, I apologize. Um, and last, lastly, as I scroll back to page 68, on page 96, um, the prohibiting, you're recommending the prohibiting, prohibit, prohibiting future sewer line expansion. Um, to me, that should be based on capacity 
vice out and out prohibiting it. I, I think they, I understand the recommendation. Uh, if you limit sewage, uh, you may limit development. On the other hand, it may be more beneficial to have a sewer line connection vice, you know, a, a standalone treatment system for whether it's a housing development or, uh, you know, commercial wise, all the commercials are, are most of our, if not all of our commercial properties are adjacent to the sewer lines. So I, I thought that was a kind of a strong recommendation, um, just my opinion. And uh, to recommend prohibiting something, uh, I think could tie our hands uh, in, in the future, but I guess that'll come through town committees and boards as far as if they act upon that recommendation or not. Any, any, if you could share your, the, the committee's uh, thoughts on using that terminology and the purpose yeah. of it. Yeah, I honestly, we heard pretty clearly from the community questionnaire, from our stakeholder kickoff and from our public forum in January that there is a desire to slow down not stop growth, but slow down growth. And you're exactly right. This addresses that. And, you know, we had a lot of discussion about how to address specifically sewer as a committee and with Brad Cargill. Um, but uh, where we ultimately landed was that we'd prefer to see capacity being used in environmentally sensitive areas that may already be kind of being considered or in the hopper kind of like a you know saunders point type area um instead of to a new subdivision somewhere else so we had a lot of conversation about potentially um recommending just extending sewer for uh commercial businesses or um you know i mean just to show you the range of discussion, the word moratorium was, you know, used as well. We didn't land there, obviously, from the recommendations. Um, but uh, yeah, again, menu of available options. Okay. I did finally scroll back to page 88 on recommendation four. Um, outside of solar, what other recommendations do you have for renewable energy sources that would provide electricity for all buildings for new developments and housing developments, I'm assuming, and then commercial development as well. Um, I think this was really geared towards solar, specifically just individual rooftop, rooftop solar, right? So uh, perhaps a neighborhood may not be energy independent, you know, um, but um, perhaps the regulations. Um, you know, require new buildings uh, to be built with rooftop solar. Would you, would you, was, would that be a, a zoning requirement? I could see it in a few places. You could probably, yes, especially if you're um, looking at just kind of a one-off, um, especially in terms of commercial buildings. Um, I could see a place for it in the subdivision regulations. Uh, if you're talking about building a, a new neighborhood, um, many things to explore in that recommendation, but we felt strongly enough about it, about individual buildings being part of the overall solution to reduce greenhouse gases and our dependency on, you know. And predominantly solar was your thoughts with this recommendation, correct? Predominantly solar, yeah. Okay. All right, that's all I had. I, I would like to pass along my compliments and thanks to the, the committee and the members of the public who participated in your several meetings. Uh, I had the pleasure of being on the planning commission the last time this document was developed and I know it takes a lot of time and effort and I think you guys have done a great job. So thank you for your efforts. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Mrs. Hardy. Okay. Um... I have some general comments, and then uh, we'll refer to some specifics. But uh, thank you to my fellow board members for doing the heavy lifting uh, with all of the questions and comments. Uh, so first of all, uh, Michelle, what is uh, the final deadline for comment period? 
So um, the Planning Commission is expected to take this up on November 10th for a public hearing. And um, depending on the length of that public hearing, a vote uh, to adopt the document could potentially happen that night. It is due in December to the state of Connecticut. So once this gets on file with the state of Connecticut, um, it's with the understanding that these are recommendations as to how we hope to move forward, but uh, it's a plan that we then have 10 years before the next plan of development or the next update is due, that, many, that the majority of these things would be accomplished within the next 10 years? Yeah, I mean, that would be great if they were. Um, <laughs> I think Paul can probably speak to this, certainly uh, Mark, both Marks. Um, looking at previous plans of conservation and development, um, we tend to have a, a spotty implementation rate. And I say that very respectfully because things come up, situations change. Uh, a lot of the times the plan of conservation and development will have some really big ideas that just take, you know, more than 10 years to, to get oomph behind. But um, certainly that would be the hope. <laughs> See what that's Roseanne. I think she just dropped off just a second ago. Yeah, her, she's not on the list anymore. Oh man. Oh man. I was I that offensive. That. <laughs> you know, we have it on tape, Michelle, so I can I'll rewind it when she gets back on. We'll start over. Um, I I will watch to see her come back on and I'll invite her back in. I'll go through some of my pages here and um and then I guess, I think Rosie probably hung up on purpose because she, she always likes to be last. You know, she likes to clean it up at the end. Well, I don't so, think she was even close to being finished. No, no, I know. Mm -hmm. I know. Um, but, but, but she wants me to go. That's, that's, that's the thing. Mark, Mark will understand where I'm coming from with this. I, for, obviously, first of all, did you volunteer for this? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, great job to the, to the whole committee. And, you know, when we, when we make recommendations, and they could be strong ones. And in opposition, you know, you know it comes from the heart because we all want the same thing um, for our town. Uh, I, I've sat in a position as chair of zoning where the plan of conservation and development has been shoved in my face. Like, no, no, you have to do it this way, or you have to accept this, or I've been in court uh, and the plan of conservation development has been used against the town in a decision. Um, so I, I do come in with a little bit of, oh God, you can't say that. Um, there's a court case on this, and this is a potential issue. So I'm gonna just say it, and you'll take it or you'll leave it and, and, and take what you need and leave the rest. Um, I was a little, um, I said this last week when we were setting up this meeting, I was a little, I noticed a lot of conservation, not a whole lot of development. And I understand you, you, you had your stakeholders meeting. Of course, the people that typically would go to that, um, other people that want to be heard about those particular issues, right? Um, um, uh, you got to keep in mind your audience, just like when we did, um, um, open space um, a survey a bunch of years ago, the people that returned the surveys are the typical people that uh, would want the open space and et cetera. Um, that All said, right, I'm back. I know you are. I'm gonna save you to the end now. Yep. I'm sorry you fell off. Your, your connection was getting real bad too. Um, so, uh, but I'll save you to the end. I'm gonna, I'm gonna race through this. On page, um, on page nine, um, the second paragraph, the Gateway Plan Development District has been developed since 2009. Of course, it's only been really developed in the last couple of years, but it was planned, I think, way back in 2000. I came onto zoning in 2000 and we changed the zone and we talked about, well, we don't want it to look like Crossroad where there's just a bunch of big box stores. We want to put a, a master plan together. And there was some development considerations back in 2000. That just jumped out at me in 2009. I've seen that used. Um, in fact, we have a, a zoning issue these days. 
talking about yeah. um, master plans. Um, Let me so just that, clarify that real quick. Yeah, we have good. to legally put in progress since the 2009 plan. So update on what okay. has happened in the 2009 plan. So that's one of the things that has happened from the 2009 plan to now. Not indicative okay. of the whole timeline, just indicative of our POCD okay. cycle. Terrific. This, this, um, and I'm going to bring this up a couple times. I'm going to point out where it comes up. I have a big concern about the aquaculture and the focus that this plan put on aquaculture. It is important. There's no doubt about it. And I fully supported it up until I also heard from all the other users of the river saying it doesn't always mix. Um, uh, jet skiing and marinas and um, paddle board and all this other stuff and, and shell fishing and taking some of the river away from shell fishing. I see both sides of it. I'm trying to be tolerant to both sides, but we're also seeing this being used against us in a court. So I thought um, I'm on page, um, I fold all these pages down. On 15, the economic development at the very end of that paragraph says, therefore promotion of aquaculture and the individuals harvesting, harvesting such products should be encouraged within the town. Yes, and we need to find a balance. And I would love for the conservation development to to mention that, find a balance so we can use, listen, there's a thousand acres in, in Niantic River. There's 1,000 acres. We can find a way for all the uses to work together. And I, and I would hope that you guys would maybe author it that way. You do mention, read the next, the next section, reduce cost of services. You do mention that industrial and commercial lands are 30 cents on the dollar for, for taxes, as well as open space. But I'm wondering the open space number is that taking into consideration the purchasing of open space? Like I have a couple of deals on the table now that we can buy a big chunk of open space for 15 or $18 million, but I think we'd go broke. Um, and I'm not sure if the third, the 0.37 cents on, uh, for, for taxes, I guess that's the cost of taxes um, or for open space, if that includes the acquisition. Mm -hmm. Do you happen to know? Um, I don't. This is a well-published study that's nationally done by the American Farmland Trust. Okay, uh, yeah, they right. do it in a bunch of states, but I, I would argue that if you partnered with a nature conservancy or something like that to get them to purchase the open space, you'd hit that number easily. Yeah, it's, we have. And it turns out they don't just give the money away. They, they want us to fundraise for it and, and then take loans and they would acquire you know, low interest rate loans for us to pay back the ones that we've talked to so far. But there is an acquisition cost to open space and I, that needs to be pointed out. And I'm not sure if that figure uses that. Obviously, wide open space isn't costing us much at all. Um, um, and, 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 and that was my concern there. Um, again, I'll go back to on page um, uh, 16, where we talk a lot about aquaculture hub and, um, and, and, and all that. It, it's brought up again. There's also, and I guess I'll come to it, um, so I'll move on. Um, the wedding stuff at the at the farms we have been down that road again i'd hate to see this be shoved in the zoning in zoning's face um there might be appropriate farms where there's no residents residents around and something could be done we did discuss alcohol but it's a it's a it's more of a quality of life if you're living on, and, and, and I, I love Pauline Lord, she's a friend, and I, and I hope she calls me a friend at Waikiki Farm. They brought this application before zoning, and, and the neighbors around the lake were saying, we don't want to hear wedding bands on Sunday afternoon. Never mind the alcohol and the winding road and all the traffic it will bring um, to Patagansett Road. Um, but it's, I bought my house on a beautiful lake, and I expected quiet, not a wedding factory and that's a big concern I, I know it's a big thing that farms are doing now obviously the stonington vineyards and all these vineyards are having concerts and a big concerts five thousand people at these concerts obviously we could limit the numbers and, and i'm not 
trying to bring it to the extreme, but I am concerned about the use. If, if a farm has several hundred acres and they're not surrounded in a, um, a highly residential area like Patagansett is, um, I could see maybe something. Weddings, are, weddings can be raucous and, and loud. Um, so that's that. I think that. that makes a lot of sense. And I think that maybe we could look at places like Stoneacre in Stonington and the different vineyards to see how they're um, interacting with the people who are surrounding them as well and like okay. how they manage that. Because yeah, there are some pretty successful models there for tourism in particular. Okay. So if we could see um, what they're doing and how they manage the interactions with the other members of the community, that could be helpful. Terrific. If we decide to move forward on that path. Yeah, yeah. And again, there's a lot of uh, farms up north uh, away from residential that probably would be suitable. And maybe we could, maybe zoning can look at that as, as far as the number of acres and the number of people and getting sign offs from neighbors um, who That's a good idea. accept it, you know. Um, page 23 um, mentions a whole lot about educational campaigns. And I'm wondering if um, you have in mind who might do all these campaigns. Um, um, town-wide education, communication campaign, education campaign on proper maintenance of septic systems, campaigns on animal waste impacts, public service announcements, um, et cetera. Was there any thought, is there, are there any other towns, if you did any research on this, um, do, do, do they have a PR department? Do they have a, um, a communications department? We do have some studies where they've partnered with outside organizations and I think the Niagara River watershed is a really good model for that. Just even in our town, they've done a lot of lawn maintenance campaigns where, as you know, they've received grant funding to expand the program even further. Um, when we talked to Wendy Dart from, the, not Wendy Dart, Wendy, um, whose last name is escaping me, from the uh, Arts, uh, Southeastern Connecticut Arts Council, uh, she Excellent. talked about, um, if I'm, I'm blowing her name, um, clearly, but, um, that it will be in the backup documentation. Um, we talked about collaboration with different artist groups for things like this, right? So an educational campaign doesn't need to be, um, you know, a bunch of webinars. It can be new signage, uh, in partnership with the artist collaboratives at things like um, our trash cans on what is, is was and what is not recyclable um, signage, um, much like what we have installed at Hole in the Wall about runoff and pollinators. So when we say educational campaigns, there's a really big variety of, of what that means. And um, yeah, that'll be one of our charges to, to figure out how to best implement that. Did you just volunteer? Did no. I just get voluntold? Yeah, <laughs> to be the educator. Okay. Um, the next paragraph uh, on the recommendations on page 23, number three, prior prioritize existing plans to extend domestic wastewater. You've already explained it. You mentioned Saunders Point. We tried desperately to put stewards in Saunders Point. It was going to be $30,000 a house. Uh, the, most of that borne onto the homeowners, and we didn't feel that we could push that onto the homeowners, some um, who would have to move um, um, because they couldn't afford $30,000 even over um, a couple of dozen years. So I, I, we've tried, I think, um, I, I, just, I want you to know that Saunders Point being used as an example is something we've already tried. Um, and, and, and we just did that a couple of years ago, we did a big study and it's too costly to put down there right now. And if, um, the state comes down and demands that we do it, then they might have some money for us. If, and when they demand, um, that sometimes happens. So just want to put that out on, there on the record. There, um, on, on page 25, um, for, uh, page, uh, paragraph 14, discouraged dredge, dredging elsewhere. I don't know if when, 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 um, when a municipality or state takes um, sand from the bay and brings it back up to the beach. I don't think that's called dredging, um, but we need that desperately. And I'm not sure that that's mentioned here. Uh, we need it desperately on our beaches, especially Crescent Point and McCook's is a call for um, uh, citizens have been reaching out and we're 
um, it's on the it's on the priority list for next year uh, to start working toward looking for federal and state grants that we can start rebuilding our beaches. They're getting washed away with these big storms that come up. It takes a lot of the sand back out to the bay. So if you don't have, obviously this is talking about dredging and I understand what you're asking, but it did, it did trigger um, if there's an opportunity um, to put that in that we should look at making sure our beaches um, have sand and th that are rebuilt over periods of time. Okay. Um, the demolition delay ordinance says, it, you mentioned on page 29, paragraph 11, it needs to improve. And um, I, I, everybody involved has told me it's great. And they're happy that it's, it's working. They're able to get into these houses and document what's there. Did your committee have anything in mind that it needs to improve? Uh, again, uh, the, the, the historic people uh, that I've talked to, um, I thought were on board. I think this did come from um, members of mm -hmm. the historic properties uh, groups. Um, let me just... Yes, we worked on this in partnership with the Historical Society, Brookside Farm, Samuel Smith, and Historic Properties Commission. Many of these recommendations were things that um, they felt strongly about as well. Of course, we discussed them as a committee and determined whether or not we were going to include them or not. But um, this, they, th this recommendation, th this section received their full support. Okay. Uh, I'll jump quickly to page 35, um, number six, right at the top, systematic maintenance programs should be in place to review um, regular vacuuming and, and ca catch basin clean out. I believe that is being done, and there is some federal um, EPA mandates coming down that is going to require us to do three times as much as what we do now, which will um, put a little bit of burden on public works and in our, in our annual budget, but we... Um, it's being discussed at the state level right now and, and it, it, you know, slowly bringing it up. But I know that we're on a maintenance plan now. I, I just wanted to point that out. Um, we have, and I brought this up last time, we have 1% industrial land in this town, 4% commercial. Um, your, your study does well to document that. We have 37% open space, if you can include the conservation, recreation, and undeveloped land. 25% um, if you just take open space and the Yale property, 25% of our, our land mass is open space now. Not to say that we shouldn't save as much as we can. Um, um, we all feel the same, but, but, but I do think we should be looking for a space where industrial or commercial would go if appropriate. Um, if someone, you know, we talk about sustainability, um, we, you know, we don't have a whole lot of high paying jobs in our town. Uh, many of our residents have to leave. Of course, we're all at home right now on our kitchen tables, but, but, uh, when, when, um, post COVID, there's a whole lot of people that get out of town and have to go over to EB or Pfizer or, um, many commute down in New Haven or Hartford. Um, businesses are looking for towns like us to relocate or, and it doesn't have to be heavy machinery polluters. It can be office parks and it can be um, light manufacturing uh, that wouldn't have anything to do with disturbing the aquifer or anything like that. And there's, and I did point out at the last meeting, um, um, you know, there's a space when you come off of um, society road, um, the sharp bend right there, um, coming off from New Haven, uh, coming from that side and coming off, you come to an abrupt stop, but right across the street, many people don't realize that's prison property, that's state property, right there, miles away from the prison. And maybe, and the topography is tough there, but so is it, the topography is also tough at, on Hatchet Hill Road in Old Lyme, where they've managed a business park that is wildly successful and, and, and uh, might be fully built out. Maybe, if you look at that, maybe there's an opportunity there in the future. And, and I, I would hope that your, your study, when we talk about conservation and development, looks to that. You did talk a lot about um, commercial um, and, and, and that uh, we need to max it out. And I, it is maxed out. Uh, most of what will be built from this point forward will be rebuilds 
will be knockdown rebuilds. And while I know there's a there's a place in your in your report that asks for a preservation, a historic preservation of some of the um, the grand homes on Route One, that is a commercial district. So we gotta we gotta weigh that out. And if we're gonna take commercial away, should we be expanding it somewhere else? We don't want to pave paradise, and we do live in a very nice place. Um, but there has to be an opportunity for um, for growth and jobs and um, future. You know, right now again we have manufacturers. I have businesses looking to build buildings, and there's no place to put them. And we turn them away. We, we turn them away quite a bit. Um, so I, I just a statement. Um, your committee can do what it needs to do with that, I suppose. Um, I'll jump right over to page 55. That maintain the state main, main state mandated levels of affordable housing stock. Very very few communities out of the 169 in the state of Connecticut, especially many of the towns. Um, hit that 10% number. It's a number that some politicians somewhere um, put as a lofty, lofty goal. I will tell you, East Lyme is among the highest in, East, in southeastern Connecticut for um, providing affordable housing. Among the highest. Um, and, and we've done great work in the last 10 or 20 years adding to that stock. Um, and, and I just wanted to point that out. Um, yes, we're not at 10%. Um, yes, that means we have developments presented to us that aren't always what we want and where we want them. But um, and until that day comes, that is the case. Um, but I did want to point that out. We, we have a very high number of affordable housing, um, a very high percentage. Um, on the next page, you have those, those two um, items in yellow. Um, the, as I know it, the Jag Capital has been renamed and it should be renamed in your report as a Rocky Neck Village. Uh, Jag Capital was a company that owned it prior to the present owners. Uh, Rocky Neck Village, I believe, is going to be government assisted affordable housing. That's what they've applied for. Um, not originally, but this is what they changed their application to. And I believe the PADS construction on North Brybrook Road will be standard affordable housing going in your second graph. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank yeah. you. Hopefully that helps. We'll get with town staff to make sure that's in there. Yes, great. Yes, um, a lot of construction accessory apartments. I, I, uh, I'd like to comment as well on page 59, the assessor, the accessory apartments. This will bring a lot of kids to our system. It just will. Um, um, we, we've, we've fought this fight many years, um, and we, that's why we don't allow accessory apartments um, or in-law apartments, because traditionally it also has attracted the brother in law with the two kids trying to get into the better school system or whatever it is. We have an outstanding school system and people will, they, they'll do anything to come here. Um, many families will. And that's why that hasn't been encouraged. Um, if there's a way to be restricted that it's 55 and older, that it really truly is an in-law apartment, that it's, um, cause that is a trend. Um, I, I, I could support that, but I hate to see that in this report and I know why you're doing it, and then have it be used against the town later. And that's, again, uh, backs up some of my comments before. Um, I'll move on and skip some of these comments because I've taken up a lot of time. And I think I... There is a, there is a concern on page um, 73, I guess. Uh, at, toward the bottom, we talk about support aquaculture and agri agriculture and aquaculture as important economic activities to, to sustain uh, sustainable food. Uh, there's not a comment in here about um, a change in zoning to attract shellfish processing, which is not allowed in our town. Um, and so the people taking fish, shellfish, something out of the water, have to move it to another town uh, to process it can't be processed here. The, the problem I've discovered in, in, in all the controversy with the shellfishing is that processing and leisure, water leisure activities do not mix. When, you have, when you're sitting on your, I don't know how much boats are, 
Um, I'm not a boat guy. Your $50,000 boat over in that marina over there, and you you have your thing going on on Sunday afternoon, and you're, you're out there, and the processing plant is right next to you. And it brings a, a big odor. It brings it with seagulls. and also brings a little, um, brings the scraps back into the water. Um, and, and so it dirties up the water. It doesn't mix. Do we need to find a place to put a shellfish processing that doesn't disturb what we already have? Many years ago, we made a conscientious effort to attract marinas and recreational um, boating and water uses for tourism. And we made a conscientious effort to move away from industrial and more into recreation. You can't have both at the same place. And, um, and that's specific in our zoning regulations. Is there a place for, for, um, for processing? Uh, and you could probably address that and maybe that's a task that maybe zoning could attack. Yeah, I think this is a really interesting question, um, especially when you're talking about mixed use and, um, you know, conflicts potentially from neighbors. And I know that out on Fisher's Island, they have Fisher's Island oysters and they do shellfish processing there. So maybe there's something that can be learned from that community and how people can coexist with the shellfishing industry. So we can look into that some more. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Of course, they have all that those miles of, of shoreline, um, and we have you know probably just that little area near the right. bridge. Um, mm -hmm. But but yeah, I mean, it'd be great for everyone to coexist. And again, we have a lot of shoreline too, and we should be able to find ways to make that work. Um, I, on page seventy six, under recommendations number two, continue to recognize the need for additional re uh, recreational fields. Um, mm -hmm. I'd like to just maybe, maybe it could be pointed out in your report, if we go to a, a more synthetic fields over at Bridebrook or Peretz Park, we'd eliminate some need for fields. Um, you do mention that the fields shouldn't be, you mentioned it somewhere else. Um, a couple pages later on 77, number 12, support the preservation of East Lime's farmland and avoid installation of future recreational fields on existing farmlands. Where is that happening now? Where did that come from? Let me look at the page. Can yeah. you see the, end, so the page seven, number? Page Much seven, of this we worked very closely with Dave Putnam on. Yeah. 77? Page 77, number 12. Support the preservation of East Lime's farmland. Of course, that's throughout your, your mm -hmm. report. And yep. avoid installation of any future recreational fields on existing farmlands. And I wasn't aware of any plans to or... Nope. I don't think that there yeah. are plans to, but that's where there's a lot of acreage. Yeah, it's not town owned, of course. They're all private land uh, situations, I believe. So I, I, I was very confused how that could even happen without the town making a conscientious effort that we need a poem. Um, and therefore, you know, it would, be the rec it would be the referendum and it would be the whole thing. And whereas um, this is more of a guide. Um, so that's all. Um, <laughs> on the eve of the referendum for the public safety building, I'll just bring, make a few comments. Um, um, the senior center in the library is indeed out of space and our new public safety building has 13,000 square feet. And you do mention that in your report, I believe, um, of ability for the town to move in there. And our plans, um, long-term plans would be to create space at the library for senior center and the library in that building and avoid needing to expand um, the facility, if at all possible. And you, you do make mention of that on page 78. Um, And again, uh, under recommendations number two, uh, continued evaluation. Uh, just one other thing, and I would just please, please consider um, um, checking this out. The town um, on page 83, town government should make a survey to determine the challenges or the changes required to make the town hall fully handicapped accessible. I'm not aware that it isn't. Um, and you may mention somewhere about the front door. The front door has a handicap button where the doors open automatically. And, and then if you need to be downstairs, you do have to go outside into the back door. And um, there's no way that we're gonna put an elevator in that building or that hasn't been um, something that I think has been talked about. Um, but any future changes certainly would have to meet the handicap standards. But I, somewhere in your report, it does say that uh, you, 
you can go up a ramp, but you can't get in uh, without aid. And uh, there is a handicap um, automatic door opener there. So if you could just review that. Um, this is an excellent report and don't take my plethora of comments as anything more than um, someone who cared enough to read your report um, and, and has used uh, your report, uh, the prior reports, um, to the town's benefit, but I've also seen it used in other ways. And I just want you to consider that, that this is a, a whole big packet of good ideas, but um, um, I hope you take my comments um, as they're intended. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Hart, as usual, okay. bring it in. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to follow up on some of the comments that my fellow board members have made. Um, the idea, um, I think it was Mr. Solano that mentioned uh, the hydro, hydroponic gardening. Uh, we do have a couple of um, residents in town who've had vast experience with that, who would be helpful, very helpful in getting something going along those lines. Um, and I think that that would be uh, very promising. The electric charging stations, good idea. I've read that in some other communities, they are allowing uh, people who are um, installing charging stations in their own homes, outside their own homes, allowing them to post on uh, Facebook or similar pages that they have electric charging stations available, and they're charging for that service for people who are coming through, for instance, people who might be driving through Connecticut, they could go online and see that somebody at number six Westview Village Drive has a charging station and they can go there and charge their car. Um, I don't know. I don't know that that's something that we want to encourage, but when we put in things like this, we have to, I think, be aware that there are some, um, perhaps there's some baggage that comes along with some of these things. Um, I was wondering, uh, Michelle, that if you feel that with all of the recommendations in the report, if we have adequate commissions already existing that could work on and address these problems, or if you see a need for us to commit uh, to uh, develop additional subcommittees, for instance, now, what is the committee's thinking on that? Yeah, we did speak on that. And one of the things that um, I'm not sure if this draft has a note for a placeholder, if it's just in the table of contents, one of the things that is on our to do list before December is to take this document and index the recommendations and and assign them to various boards and commissions for primary responsibility of evaluation and execution. Um, and so yeah, I think that we would hope that there would be some subcommittee work going on in the existing boards and commissions to address this. Certainly, uh, it, is, it is going to, we've already spoken about the planning commission's role in this and that uh, the subcommittee will remain after the adoption of the plan to facilitate its implementation and it will be a regular monthly agenda item on the planning commission agenda, but that's a really valid question. And I'm not sure it's one that we fully know the answer to yet. Okay. Uh, the section that was addressed by a couple of other board members on affordable housing, um, the, um, we, we are never going to achieve the 10%. As Mr. Nickerson said, uh, there isn't any other town along the coastline in particular that has achieved it. And I believe that there are only a couple of major cities in the state that have achieved that. And the reason is that when a developer comes in with a proposal for avoiding affordable housing, uh, that developer only has to have 30% designated affordable, and the rest can be 70%. So therefore, you're adding 70% to the inventory of non-affordable, only 30% affordable, and you're never going to be able to make the goal. You can't keep up. It's impossible. And um, so I think, that that's, uh, I think that that's a major drawback, but that's at the state level that when um, – but it doesn't help us to create more affordable housing zones in town because we can't win. Uh, even though no other towns have achieved the 10%, that is still kind of held against us. And secondly, you're not allowed to use um, 
existing housing, uh, which was built prior to the passing of the Affordable Care, I mean, the, uh, the Affordable Housing Act. So every week in the real estate sales section of the newspaper, you see as many as 10, 15 houses in town that are older houses that are well within the range of affordable housing, but you can't count them as part of your inventory because they were pre-existing before the law was passed. So I think we have to be very careful of that. And I'm referencing the chart um, in the document that labels uh, the current land use by type Mm -hmm. and divides. And um, we have 20% of our land that is still undeveloped. And I think that we have to work very hard, very hard, to get that protected. Um, There's many ways to have recreational activities without having it designated as a park or something of that nature. But it's this undeveloped land that has really, uh, unfortunately, we don't own it, most of it, but it's what's contributed to the quality of life in our town and also the positive environmental impact. And that leads me to the fact that uh, we do have a rather mild recommendation in the report that we try to acquire um, more land for, but I perhaps broaden it, not just open space, but for town uh, town usage. Um, And we need to start a a designated uh, account efforts to begin to build up accounts so that when properties become available, we have some money for, to put it in terms of buying a home, uh, to have a down payment. Uh, Because so often properties become available at the last minute and we can't beat out the developers because we don't have, we don't have any money stockpiled. And I, so I think that that would be something that would be a very important goal for us to begin to work on immediately when it comes to budget time. And time and time again, when we try to set up an account such as this, it's one of the first things to go because many people would say, well, that's a wish list. It's not a necessity. So I, I'm not quite sure what section that would go in, um, but I think that um, there are a couple, couple of areas that it, you might be able to be more descriptive uh, in the recommendation. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think I think that this is going to generate a lot of enthusiasm in town. It gives us a lot of goals for as a community for us to come together and work on. And I would suggest that the, when you make your um, sort of divide up the, the tasks that uh, commissions be encouraged to bring in uh, other members from the community who could um, sit in on committee meetings. They wouldn't have a vote, but they would have various levels of expertise that they could bring to the committee, such as the idea of, um, you know, the hydroponic growth, um, the electronic charging stations. Uh, You know, we have a lot of people in this community that, don't necessarily want to run for an office or be committed to a regular uh, monthly or bi-monthly meeting, but have a lot to offer and would sit on meetings and offer input. And uh, I think by, I don't know, perhaps we could on some of these uh, committees, we could have sort of the idea as um, some of the boards have of, of, you know, ex officios. They can participate in the meetings, but they don't have a vote. Um, and I agree with Mr. Nickerson that in many cases we have to be careful with the wording on many of these things. And that was why I had asked, you know, it's clear that these are recommendations. These are goals that we're working towards and we may, we won't be able to achieve all of these, but they are things that we would hope to accomplish. Uh, I also had in my notes the issue of, uh, lessening the width of the road. And I know that um, some of the subdivisions we have, we, we can't go up into those subdivisions for uh, purposes of uh, collecting waste materials because the roads aren't wide enough. Uh, the, there's a state law that, uh, and I don't know what the road limit is, 
uh, the road width, but school buses can't travel on them if, they, if the roads are not that, that width. So I think that's something we have to be very careful of. And also, uh, by limiting the um, width of the roads, it means that not only the road's narrower, but it's more houses crammed into the overall development area. Uh, one couple of other things that I'd like to mention is <clears throat> uh, with our a couple of our recent storms, we've had a lot of power outages and things. Um, I think that it should be a recommendation that uh, a requirement that any new development must have underground wires, and that in older older uh, subdivisions that do not currently have underground wires, if wiring restructuring has to be has to be redone that that would the requirement would be that it would have to be underground wiring and i think that rounds up my comments and as i said thanks to my fellow board and selectmen members for doing the heavy lifting and so they made my job easier good luck with uh the plan and in the and enacting the um coming to agreement on the suggestions and i'm hopeful that we're going to get more community input so thank you. Thank you. Paul? Yes, Michelle, going back to that earlier discussion on uh, how many recommendations do or don't get worked on and, and addressed going forward. I think one of the inherent uh, problems with the POCD process is it has numerous recommendations in it. And I don't believe uh, it's a requirement and, uh, and it may not even be allowed, but if it's not allowed in the plan itself, would it be possible for the committee who has collected all this data to try and prioritize what you thought the, the top 10 priorities would be? I'm not sure if that's the right thing to do, but something to consider. And if it's not in the plan itself, it could be done by the subcommittee, presented to the Board of Selectmen for information and also to the Planning Commission for information. It may help get more things done if we at least understand what you all who did all the hard work uh, think should be the priorities for the town. That's a really great idea. Just uh, some of our discussions um, about implementation. One of the first things that we want to do um, once the plan is adopted is take it on a road show of sorts. And myself and Kirk uh, will go to the various uh, board and commission meetings. Um, as you've discussed here, some of the things are valid recommendations, but they may have been tried uh, before and we're not ready to try again. Or there may be something that is a quick win to tick off. So while we kind of have um, our own understanding of what we think that the priorities might be overall in the plan, I think it'll be important to talk to the boards and commissions about what they can reasonably take on and when. So I like, um, your idea there and certainly I'm on the same page. Yeah, whether it takes six months after the plans are issued, but a set of priorities will help, I think, be more successful in implementing some of the recommendations. Mm -hmm, for sure. Great idea. Uh, Michelle, I did have one other thing from my list. Um, the um, solar park uh, and the potential of additional solar parks, many communities have realized that but that the proper place for solar parks are in industrial zones, not in residential areas. And um, I don't know if um, I don't know if we'd be able to enforce enforce that through the plan of development. But we certainly all recognize that um, perhaps we're a little bit smarter than we were before our first solar park went in. Yep. Okay. Yep. I remember the report does mention that, right? It, it, should, it should go in commercial industrial areas. But of course, it goes back to my comment that we have 1% industrial. Maybe that's where it should go along the highway. Um, take that state land back and fill it with, it with solar, a solar farm where nobody lives up there. Um, and and maybe, maybe the topography is bad, but maybe it isn't. Maybe, maybe a microgrid grid can go there. By the way, the microgrid, um, we, are, we were exploring and we had man 11th hour 59th minute um we thought we were getting a microgrid at lily b uh, with that whole municipal complex 
and we were driving it home because the middle school, as you know, is our um, shelter, a, a community shelter, not community, but regional shelter, like eight towns. Um, so we were all the way there and we just missed out on the, on the grant, um, but that will come back into play. Um, it was a, just a couple of years ago when we were building the schools. That's a great place for a microgrid and we are exploring that uh, once again. That's a great hey, Mark? Yeah. I have just two more comments. Um, there was some discussion about road road with uh, Michelle and uh, prior commissions there was discussion about the reduction of the width of the roads and one alternative that other communities have looked at is actually changing the curbing mm -hmm. so that cars that are parking there could actually instead of it being a hard curb it could be more of a ramp and the cars could kind of pull a little halfway on the grass uh, to alleviate the crowding of the road if, if you go smaller. Um, the other complaint we I have heard um, from Public Works is our cul-de-sacs uh, and your requirements to cul-de-sacs require a grass area, which is fine and there's good reasons for it to reduce pervious service. But they're pretty um, they're pretty narrow if you've been through them. Mm -hmm. And um, something I've also wondered too, is it better to have it grass if it is or is it better to have it with with trees and stuff that could absorb um, some of the rain? Just, just throwing it out. The, the last thing I wanted to say was um, just following up on Roseanne was talking about the 10% of affordable housing. To add on to that, that makes it more difficult to get to that 10% is usually affordable housing is deeded over a 30 year time period. So when the deed comes up, we already have affordable mm -hmm. housing that I believe has come off the market. So that starts reducing mm -hmm. yeah. our amount of affordable housing, even though those are being sold for affordable prices. The danger with that is it could lead to perpetual development where we keep adding so many units of affordable housing as they're dropping off and then we are we could have a town full of condominiums. So there's just something that to be considered that the, the state, is, it has to be deeded um, affordable housing and there are some issues with that with the, the third year. I totally appreciate everything that we've said around this discussion because we've gone there ourselves right um so you will see that there's a recommendation actually i wish i remembered this roseanne when you just asked me that question there is a recommendation for one new subcommittee or slash commission which is on affordable housing because um i don't we're in the you know the state mandate is the state mandate right so yeah. i don't think we're going to recommend that we not follow it right but I totally understand the flaws in the mandate itself. And I think what was difficult, which is difficult for a lot of towns, was to make it very clear that we understand the need for a diverse offering of affordable housing in East Lyme in locations that are appropriate, not only environmentally, but um, in terms of access to town services, recreation, schools, for your children who are screaming in the other room, um, very well timed, uh, you know, things like that. So um, I think what we'd like to do is be more proactive about it, um, you know, even understanding that that 10% is a, a goal that gets chased. Yep. Well, we have we have our own local local state representative and state senator, and I think that we need to uh, begin to uh, ask them to move forward to make the at the state level the Affordable Housing Act, uh, shall we say, more appropriate or more realistic. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Mich good, all good points. And Michelle, um, did your group do any studying on the available, not available housing stock, but the housing stock, the inventory of housing and at different levels mm. in East Lyme? Uh, do you mean market rate wise? Yeah, I call it market rate, right? Or assessed value wise or whatever. But, you know, what if you can afford a $200,000 house is what are there neighborhoods of that and and you know all the way up and what percentage 
and therefore it speaks to the affordability. My point is triggered by Mark bringing this up, uh, um, Roseanne bringing it up, that a lot of the houses we have would qualify under affordable, mm -hmm. but not in the state program. They were built earlier than the state program was initiated, or they're just single family homes. I don't believe single family homes qualify under the affordable housing percentage, even though we do have neighborhoods that would surely qualify. Just correct. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, and we're getting into all the reasons why we recommend an affordable housing yeah. subcommittee yeah. because this is if it was an easy problem to solve we wouldn't be having this conversation tonight. I mean, we could go on and on, I'm sure. And that's not a cop out. It's because I really think that, you know, this, the time needs to be devoted to just this. Yeah. And I, and I think um, what we just, you know, what we feel is affordable housing isn't necessarily what the state thinks. So I, I this is an interesting discussion that if we know we have so much stock that's considered affordable, actually even in the 60 to 80% of the median income that we have that doesn't count to it, it would be interesting to know what our stock is yeah. of units that would sell at market rate that are 60 to 80%, even though they're not deed restricted and counted in the state total. Just, I mean, it's a, great, it's a great thing for us to have is talking points in our town uh, yeah. to talk about affordability. And, you know, we're not all $700,000 colonials uh, are in big architecturally built houses. We have uh, working class neighborhoods and, and sometimes those get overlooked. Um, and I think uh, my, our town assessor could probably pull that, those numbers together pretty easily. Just use, uh, assessed value if not market value, assuming that everything is correct. And we'll have those reports anyway, as we go into the reval. But um, um, interesting conversation. Uh, I'm not sure what you can do with that as a committee. Um, you're you're going to assess what we have, but you know, they're not going to necessarily be builders of homes or, or whatever. Um, but, but I think uh, citizens att uh, attending to this issue is a good thing. That's a great, it's a great, it's a great idea. And sustainable. Mark, Mark, I think that comes back to us as the board of selectmen yeah. to get this info and to start working with our state representatives to say, you know, Make this make this a reasonable, workable law so that um, developers don't use this against us. I know it's a bit of a third rail, um, as I've been told. But but you're absolutely right. There's a way that this could be written uh, that would work for towns. Um, hmm. And um, enough said, probably on the subject. Of course. Well, I say, I say enough said that I go on to yet the next thought that pops in my head, which is, you know, to, if the judge tomorrow approves the affordable housing on Oswegatchie Hills for 800 units, 30% affordable, we're going to be pretty close to our, the number, um, if not over the number, like that. Um, and of course, he's been at this for over 20 years and um, there hasn't been a shovel on the ground yet. However, he continues to make progress um, in our, in our the court systems, various applications. Um, and we can leave that there. If I can, if I can shift here, just one other point that I'd like to point out is I didn't even touch upon the traffic stuff and the, and the parking and the uh, suggestions and they're all good suggestions. We're at such a disadvantage in our town because our two main thoroughfares, three main thoroughfares, all our commercial district is all state roads. And you know mm -hmm. that already. Um, and I'm not sure if your, your, your report specifically points out of, with the acknowledgement that it's a state road and we, are, we have our hands tied and we don't get to make those decisions. Um, we hope the town can petition. And it's all we can do is ask. And, being in the seat for six years, um, they have their standards and there's not much, there's not much slack at all in their standards. And, um, and uh, probably rightfully so, they, they're, they're dealing with a whole lot of the towns and a whole lot of roadway, but you know, uh, better crosswalks. Uh, we, I, one specific thing mentioned, the parking should be lined and delineated. I mean, we should have, very specific parking spaces down on Main Street. And uh, we actually talked about that and we don't want that. And um, 
I know the record button's on and I'm, this is on the record, but if you do that, you will take away 50% of the parking spaces on Main Street because you need so many feet between each curb cut and be, so many feet on, away from crosswalks. So, and, and so for the, <laughs> it would be safer if you had 50% of the parking spots down on Main Street, but you'd also lose a whole lot of parking uh, that the merchants would uh, suffer uh, because of that. And it's a lot of parking. So instead we did um, petition the state to put a white line to make Main Street feel like it shrinks a little bit or narrows and therefore people tend to drive slower. And we think, we think we've seen progress with that. But there's so much that could be do, done down on Main Street. It is dangerous. It's dangerous to be a pedestrian. It's dangerous trying to, trying to pull out. Um, uh, the good news is with a lot of traffic, especially in the summer, uh, traffic tends to just slow, be slow anyway. Uh, it might be more dangerous in the winter when things are a little quieter and people can buzz uh, from the Children's Museum all the way down to the intersection uh, with not a lot of hitting the brake. Um, in the summer, that's impossible. Um, but your, your report does a great job of spelling out the great ideas, some art just to slow down parking. We've talked about that, but the, all the issues stem with the state. So I'm glad it's all in there. Uh, that's one time where I'm, I'm glad you're just filling it up with things um, that it won't be used against the town, it'll be used against the state, but I'm not sure that they listen. Um, but it's good that it's in there and it's collecting our thoughts. It's good. Any other comments from the selectmen? I'll, I'll open it up again to the public. We, I'm not sure if our agenda follows this uh, order. I don't have it in front of me, but it is. we started with the public hearing. We didn't get a, a lot of feedback from the public. Many people did join us at the end. I'm sure they've heard comments. I'd rather not bicker about the comments, but if, you, if anyone would like to speak, um, you, know, you could raise your hand. You could send a chat um <laughs> marjorie here you are are you going to talk about bees yes i am great Come hi on. everyone my name is marjorie Mikoff, and i am the the founder and a uh, president of a new nonprofit organization called pollinator pathway east line um one of our well we have several goals actually but let me first address a couple points that we have brought up tonight uh, Dan Cunningham brought up the aspect of education for residents for the use of lawn pesticides for runoff to our watershed. One of uh, Pollinator Pathways goals is to uh, reduce lawn size, hopefully encourage residents to reduce lawn size, and also to refrain from using lawn chemicals um, for two reasons, that watershed issue that he brought up, and second of all, Many of our beneficial pollinators live underground, live in the two inches below the lawn surface for several years, and we're killing them. So it's, it's a slow process of education. Um, and the reason, we're, the reason we're focused on pollinators, and I'm talking about native pollinators, I'm not talking about the foreign bees that live in hives, the honeybees. I'm talking about our native bumblebees. Um, they have been here for hundreds of years. They, they were the creatures that sustained our ancestors here. We're seeing a large reduction of them all along the East Coast. So the pollinator pathwork process is linking towns together and areas within the town to sustain the migration, reproduction, and hibernation of our native pollinators. I'm talking about the big bumblebees, which there are many different kinds. I'm talking about crickets, bats, moths, butterflies, hummingbirds, um, even some flies are pollinators. So my, our committee is really focused on the gradual education of residents of East Lyme to sustain these pollinators. Um, a lot of our land is farmland. We're concerned about our farmers not having these native pollinators. If that were to be true, say in 10 years, they would have no recourse um, except to hire honeybees, hive honeybees to be brought in. There's a huge industry of that 
just to pollinate peaches, apples, blueberries, strawberries, raspberries, etc. Um, it's estimated that one out of every three bites of food that we eat is due to the work of a native pollinator. So we take this very seriously. Um, right now, our present goal is to raise funds for 20 pounds of native seed. We have been granted the use of several acres of private land in the Flanders area, which I'm not allowed to disclose the areas yet, um, but it's a 99% done deal. This two acre plot will be seeded this fall. Um, it will be uh, available to the public. We'll have pass through it so people can walk through it. Um, it will retain its full maturity in two years, but we're planting it this fall and it will be kind of like our showpiece for what we want to do in other parts of the town, which is our 2021 project. And that is our pollinator pledge project. We have a form which has pretty much been approved by the committee at this point. There's four points to the pledge for any resident in town. The first is to try to reduce your lawn size due to what Mr. Cunningham talked about with the lawn chemicals. And also, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> in reducing your lawn size, you'll be creating native planting beds, which will provide all sorts of lists. Uh, I'm setting up a seed library in the Eastline Public Library, so people want to choose seeds. And I'm also in the process of working with two local nurses who may provide these native plants to our residents. Uh, if, they have, if they have registered with our pledge program, uh, then they can go right to these nurseries in town and buy what they need. Kind of an inducement to have them sign the pledge. The other parts of the pledge are to create a wild area in their yard. No matter what size their yard, there's room enough to leave a, some dead trees, some branches, some leaves. Gently just move the leaves into this dead area that provides a habitat reproduction and hibernation for our native pollinators without that these clean manicured yards are destroying that um, and the other thing is they vow to plant native so i'm in the process of working with these businesses overall in the future five to ten years we hope our goal is to plant on town property. I'm interested in looking at fields, town buildings that maybe have old bushes there, boxwoods don't feed a thing, uh, unused fields and um, strips along ball fields. And also I've spoken with the public works department and they're very much in favor of less mowing they don't, they have a liability to mow certain areas alongside the road and the state does too. I've spoken with them and that's fine. Um, and the men are very agreeable to less mow. So instead of mowing all the way back 50 feet, say as the town may have to do, they're only going to mow 30. Uh, the, the state is very much involved in this program. I have the sites that uh, the supervisor has actually created pollinator pathways um, Marjorie, um, I, if I could just jump in for a second because we want to stay on topic and that is feedback for the plan of development that's already been written. Okay. But you're bringing up some things that maybe Michelle might in, in, in her in her team might be able to fold into um, certainly some um, some suggestions on the pollinator path and all that. You and I have talked and your, your, your group is getting aggressive in a good way, um, I mean, in 100% in a good way. And I think they're off to the races. It maybe if you could connect with Michelle, there might be an opportunity to, to take some of your committee's recommendations and fold them, dovetail them into some of the plan of conservation and development. Um, rather than broadcasting and shotgunning tonight, maybe there's a way that you can connect. And I can connect the two of you. I believe I have your, both your emails. Um, uh, does that make sense to you, Michelle? 
Yeah, that's great. And Marjorie, just to um, make you aware too, Protect Pollinator Pathways is um, a recommendation in this draft currently, which oh. actually references a lot of what you said about habitat, habitat loss, pesticide use, um, and it talks about best practices in terms of mowing and landscaping and encouraging natural growth. So that's on page 16 of the, of the current document. It falls under agricultural resources. Um, for lack of a better home for this recommendation, but um, if you want to check that out, a, a lot of what you said um, is in there, and we'd certainly um, be open to learning more about it. Thank you, Marjorie. Once we once the world gets normal again, I'd love for you to come in and make it your it yours you and your committee to come into the board of selectmen and make a presentation and it, it'll give you a. Um, um, an opportunity, a podium to come up and address the town and, and, and inspire us um, to, to go out and, um, and learn more about this. So if we ever get back into that big room at the town hall, uh, I'm gonna look you up and, uh, or you come find me and maybe we can get you in for a 10 minute, 12 minute um, presentation prior to a meeting. Thank you. I wish you the best of luck. I, I, I love your passion. And, uh, and again, we've talked about this. And I love some of, the, uh, some of these ideas are perfect for what Michelle's trying to do with agriculture up in the north side of town, especially. Um, but all over, all over. Thank you. Any other public comments on the public safety map? Uh, whoops. <laughs> you know it's on my mind, right? <laughs> uh, any comments on the POCD, the Plan of Conservation and Development? You can chat, you can raise your hand, you can jump up and down. Hi, Kate. Mr. Nickerson, uh, Roseanne, I'm going to have to leave the meeting at this point. I'm Thank so you sorry. very much. Okay, All right. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye now. Catherine, you need to unmute yourself. Oh, I thought you guys could read lips. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, anyway, thank you so much. I really have enjoyed listening and learning and taking lots of notes here. Thank you for everyone who's been involved with this whole process. And since I'm on the board of education, I just really see that this is a good um, opportunity, I think, to connect what's going on in our schools and to connect what Roseanne had said previously for people who are the engineers, the retired scientists, the retired engineers, the retired, everybody who has a vested interest and uh, special skills in certain areas that could help to develop the ideas and do the training, Michelle, that you're talking about. So I just really think that this is a beautiful project that you have and great ideas for us to move forward. So that's all I wanted to say, but thank you so much for all of that. Thank you, anyone else? Michelle, wonderful job. You, Kirk, Richard, um, and Rose, Rosemary had to leave early. Uh, she sent us all a chat to uh, best wishes. But uh, thank you all for your, your hard work. And you know, it's not done yet, right? You have a little bit of a road show coming up uh, to get it approved and then, and then to educate. Um, so thank you very much. Any other comments from the Board of Selectmen? We certainly didn't make it any easier for you <laughs> with all our comments. Yeah. <laughs> I feel guilty. I feel like this, some of this stuff should have come up already. And I think I probably had an opportunity or two. I just want to say that. I think, I think as I'm reading through it going, well, why didn't I let them know as before they wrote this, some of this stuff. So my apologies if, if some of this stuff is like, that uh, we, we didn't tell you uh, about it. And, uh, but whatever. Uh, I just feel like um, you did a great job. And thank you for listening and, and, uh, and taking, uh, taking in the whole night here. Appreciate it. Are there any other comments? Folks, go out and vote, go out and vote tomorrow, and, um, and we'll see you next. I think next Wednesday is a regular Board of Selectmen meeting. We'll start at 7.30 normal time. So you all be at peace. Have a good evening. Stay safe. Stay sane. And uh, see you again soon. We got we to gotta make our motion, right? Yeah, I made a motion to adjourn. Second. Okay. Motion and second. All in favor say aye. 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 Good night.